and welcome to Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and we've got another really great show for you today. We'll be featuring fall color in the garden, help you choose which tomatoes to grow this season, and we'll be hearing about an invasive grass that might look an awful lot like something you already have growing in your landscape. We'll start today's program with something that is quite common with trees when they get stressed out in late summer. Usually when leaves on trees start turning yellow or red, it's a sure sign that fall is here, but when the calendar says August, there might be something else going on. Here's our first feature on Early Leaf Drop. We get a lot of questions in late summer, early fall about trees that either lose their needles or begin losing their foliage pretty early. So I want to talk a little bit about five particular different species where we see that happen with great regularity. Let's start first with ash, green ash in particular. One of the upsides of that genus is ash trees do lose their foliage early. The downside is depending on the selection or the cultivar, some of them get some foliar diseases and they really drop early. And what we were seeing and have been seeing for a number of years is one called Patmore in particular, loses its leaves very, very early in the fall. And it really looks pretty dreadful. There's not much you can do about it, if anything, other than look the other direction, rake up those leaves. And remember, we're not recommending planting ash anyway, so nothing to treat that one with. We also see crab apples or apples in, in general starting to lose foliage, turning yellow, getting spots on the leaves in August oftentimes. And if you think about many of the things we talk about on Backyard Farmer during the regular season, our pathologists and our entomologists would say, okay, what you're beginning to see is the result of what happened way earlier in the season. And that would be you're seeing cedar apple rust, apple scab, those kinds of things with cultivars or varieties that are susceptible to those diseases if you don't treat, you are going to likely see that early leaf drop. Sanitation, of course, is excellent to be able to at least clean up that, those leaves and that fruit if it has fruited and get rid of the inoculum. Realistically, if you are not in the position to be able to plant a cultivar that is resistant and you don't want to treat those, you're just going to have to deal with it. Spring is when we treat those, so keep that one in mind. A third one is bald cypress. The beauty of bald cypress is that it is what we call a deciduous conifer. Deciduous meaning it's going to lose its needles, conifer meaning it bears a cone and they look like needles. Again, we will get calls if a bald cypress begins to go either beautiful orange, which is one of the fall colors, or a little bit of kind of a rusty yellowish color depending on the season. That's normal. So bald cypress is supposed to lose its needles when it's young, yes, it can look like a dead evergreen, so this is where a lot of good education comes into play. We also get calls about maple. Maple is one of those trees that if it goes into fall color early, like Autumn Blaze, which again is not one of the cultivars that we typically would recommend, chances are that is a tree that is under high stress. So that good red fall color that so many people, especially in Nebraska, want that is not one you want to see early enough that you'll have it in place for that first tailgate for that first football game. So make sure that if you are seeing that happen with a maple in your uh, environment, in your landscape, that you understand the stresses that that tree is under. If they are something that is environmental that you can manage, go ahead and do that. The likelihood, however, is that whatever is happening with the stress on that tree is associated with planting, the genetics, the soils, some things that it's probably unlikely that you can fix after the tree is already in place. And of course, we always get the calls about pines, white pines in particular. Those are old needles. When those yellow needles start to show up on the interior of, of those twigs, those are the old needles. It's like losing hair. Hair gets old, hair falls out. Same thing on the needles of pines. When they do that is again going to be associated directly with whether that, that uh, evergreen, that pine, has needles that are going to last two, three, four, five, seven years, or whether it is one that does that very early in the fall or later in the fall. Nothing to worry about, nothing to do. When you're taking care of your shrubs, your lawn, and your vegetable garden, 
it might be easy to forget that your trees also need water and proper care. The hot Nebraska summers can cause a lot of these abiotic symptoms, and it's a really good reminder for all of us to take care of our trees and to know what we're looking at. On this week's Go Gardening feature for beginning gardeners, we'll focus on a favorite vegetable garden vegetable, and that would be tomatoes. Any garden center will have a lot of seeds, but which ones are the right ones? And what should you start indoors, and when should you start them? If you want to have BLTs later this year, you'll have to pay attention to a few tips and read those seed packages. This week in our Go Gardening series, we want to focus on America's favorite fruit, or is it a veggie? We're talking about tomatoes. This is one of the most asked about vegetables that we have on Backyard Farmer on the regular show. So if you want to learn to grow a tomato, what do you do? It's actually pretty simple. It's one of the easiest vegetables to grow for the home gardener. You have many choices. If you want to start your tomatoes from seed, you can certainly do that. A mistake people make is they start them way too early. Then they get lank, then they get leggy, then they get unhappy, and then they're hard to transplant into the garden. So pay attention to your frost-free date because tomatoes are a vegetable that absolutely does not like temperatures, and that includes soil temperature in particular, that are too low. If you plant way early in the season, they're just going to suffer. So typically we say six to eight weeks prior to that last frost date for the area in which you live. Start them in a good media in the greenhouse or in your, on your windowsill. Watering is essential. Turn them, make sure they get enough light. An easier way for people who really don't want to go to that trouble or they're just not interested in it is go ahead and buy seedlings that have been started by somebody who knows what they're doing. In other words, one of your local garden centers or somebody who provides good tomato plants. Again, planting them in the garden, you can do it early, but, but we really don't usually recommend that. Now, one of the cool things about tomatoes is if you pinch off those lower leaves and you either lay them flat or you dig a big deep hole, they will actually root along all those locations where the old leaves were. So you wanna make sure you have great soil. We talked about soil earlier on in our Go Gardening series. Good soil, amend that planting hole so that that tomato plant has a lot of nutrients. Check your spacing. Make sure that you give it enough room because some of those things can get humongous in the garden. Go ahead and plant when the soil temps are right. They need six hours of sunlight at least a day to be able to uh, fruit and flower appropriately. So if you're in too shady of an environment, you're not going to be able to get tomatoes to grow. You wanna make sure that as they are growing, you are very consistent in your watering practices. Um, we see a lot of disease issues, particularly associated with blossom end rot, later on in the season if one, one week they're wet, then they are dry for two or three weeks, then they're, they're wet again. So make sure you are consistent in your watering practices. If you wanna use a starter fertilizer to begin with when you put them in the garden, that is a good idea. Then we also take a, a look at what are the fertility needs as they are fruiting and then later on. So when they're about the size of a golf ball, if they are one that gets big, or if they are about maybe half maturity size, you wanna go ahead and fertilize. Same thing after you make that first harvest. Most tomatoes need staking or caging. We use the words determinate and indeterminate. Determinate means they're going to put on all their fruit at one time, you pick and you're finished. Indeterminate, they grow, they flower, they fruit, they grow, they flower, they fruit. So the cages need to be substantial and sturdy and hold up to our winds. You wanna watch for diseases and insect pressure because we do have pretty significant issues with some of those. Tomato hornworm, white flies can be a problem, early blight, late blight, um, some of the leaf spot diseases, some of the viruses you cannot do anything about. So what you wanna make sure also, if you're choosing your tomato plants or your seeds, if you are concerned about those issues, choose plants or seeds varieties that are indexed to be resistant to those things. And if you're growing heirlooms, you're likely going to be dealing with all of them. So enjoy the process of planting those tomato plants in your garden or starting those seeds, and certainly enjoy the fruits of your labor. 
You've got a lot of choices when it comes to tomatoes, but if you stick to the instructions on the seed packet, pick disease resistant varieties, water and care for them consistently, there's really no reason why you can't get great tasting tomatoes. And of course, pay attention to insects and diseases. Shifting gears to our landscape lesson this week, we've got a little demonstration for you about trees on standards. What is a standard? Well, it's like a trunk, but you can have quite a number of different plants grafted on top of that trunk. Let's take a few minutes to show you what we mean. A lot of people are buying plants that are grown on a stick, or a standard as it's called, a trunk. And we wanna talk a little bit about what that means, both in terms of what you're purchasing and how you kind of should manage it later in the landscape. So a standard is simply a standard, a straight trunk, grafting a shrub, which really doesn't wanna have a single trunk, or a plant with a weeping character, like a weeping cherry or a weeping mulberry on a trunk, allows you to have that weeping form a little bit higher in the air or to have a shrub on a stick, if you will. So American Standard for Nursery Stock defines the differences between plants that are grown on standard. High standard and low standard are different plants. They will give you a different character in the landscape. Since we are in the dead of winter, let me show you a little bit using this house plant. This would be a high standard, up to maybe four feet or higher. And on top, we would graft the shrub or uh, the weeping tree. This is what you would get then, a trunk with that unusual plant grafted to the top. Low standard, on the other hand, is going to be down here in the 24 inches and under range. Still on a trunk, a single trunk, but quite lower in the landscape. One of the best examples that we see a lot is going to be blue spruce. You'll see a spruce, a globe blue spruce, typically grafted high, or you'll see it grafted low. Interestingly enough, the one that's grafted high is still going to get wide. So one of the things you wanna keep in mind as you are choosing a high standard or a low standard is what are you after in the landscape? These are pieces of art. These are typically not long-term contributors to the landscape. If that graft union is weak, as with any other grafted plant, you are going to get some failure. The, the longer the trunk and the heavier the top, we get into situations where they can actually blow out of the ground tip over in the ground. So you wanna make sure you are uh, cognizant of that and then choose based on understanding again that this is a piece of artwork. This is not going to be something that'll live in your landscape for 20 or 30 or 40 years. These plants do take a little bit more care and they aren't going to be something that's going to last forever in your landscape. If you do keep that in mind, plants on standard can be a great way to accent certain areas of your front porch or your backyard living area. There's several varieties of ornamental grasses that really make a dramatic statement in any landscape, especially those with poofy seed heads like pampas grass and fountain grass. But there is one here in Nebraska that was introduced and it's causing some problems because of its invasiveness. For our interview this week, we'll hear from noxious weed expert Brent Meyer about Phragmites. It's my pleasure to have Brent Meyer with me today, and Brent is the Lancaster County Noxious Weed Superintendent, so one would think he knows a fair piece about the weeds that are threatening to take over the state of Nebraska and perhaps the world. He's going to be talking today about frag or phragmites, which is one of those grasses that is beautiful in, in the waterways and tends to be very much a thug. So Brent, what is the big deal about frag or phragmites? Who cares? Well, Kim, Phragmites is one of the, the most aggressive noxious weeds I've dealt with in my 25 years plus of working in, in weed control. It uh, left, left alone will create a monoculture, and what that means is it will take out all the other vegetation along the waterways or in your riparian areas. And that's not good for the invertebrates, uh, the fish, the, the, the small mammals, the deer that depend on that. Uh, it would also create a fire hazard in the fall. So this time of year is a great time of year to inspect for Phragmites because you can, you can see it, all the cattails and the other vegetation break down. But Phragmites leaves its plume head on and stands 12 foot tall, so it's easy to see in the winter time. So in your creeks and your drainages, those areas that you can't see in in the summertime because of 
corn fields or leaves on the trees, now is an excellent time in the winter time to get out and take a look and see and inventory your Phragmites and map that for next year's control. So it creates a monoculture. It uh, is a fire hazard. It impedes water flow. You know the legislature actually funds a lot of a lot of the control work on our our river systems just so we can deliver water downstream. All right, Brent, is there a native frag and a non-native frag, and does that make a difference in what people should be thinking about in their landscape or in their waterways? There is native Phragmites and there's introduced Phragmites, and people need to understand the difference. We don't ever want to take out native plants out of our landscape because they're supposed to be here. They were here long before we ever were. But the introduced varieties that came over in the late 1700s, early 1800s, has completely taken, taken over a lot of the landscape in the country. So we do a lot of training. Um, people do want to know the difference between the native and the non-native, and we can help with that. So the, the non-native Phragmites is the one that we're really concerned about, and that's the one that takes over the waterways and, and actually will close off the channels in the Platte River system or any river system. Um, very aggressive. And it's easy to identify them, but there's a lot of different characteristics that you've got to look at. You can't just look at the seed head or look at just the stem. You've got to be able to, to look at the entire plant to be able to make a determination whether it's native or non-native. We have some look-alikes in the landscape. Are those plants that we're going to recommend that people look at instead of using frag? Or are there cautionary notes about those as well? There are, and that's one of the difficult things for for our staff each year when we train our new inspectors and for people to understand is, is there's a lot of grasses and there's a lot of good grasses and very beautiful grasses to have in your landscape. And I kind of refer to a lot of them as clump grasses. Typically, if it's a clump grass, it's gonna kind of stay put. But if it's Phragmites, which is a rhizome grass, it's gonna spread throughout the landscape and that nobody wants. But I think most folks don't understand the difference. Um, they'll go out into the wild and dig up some Phragmites thinking it's a good looking ornamental grass and then plant it in, in their yard and then pretty soon the weed, weed control office is coming to call on them. So there's a lot of great grasses uh, to plant in your landscape and we sure encourage that. We've got some information on our website to help people identify between the good grasses and the bad grasses and we just we want to work with people to understand the difference between those. Brent, what message do you want to leave our viewing audience with? What should they do either if they think they suspect it or they want it in their landscape? Okay, well, it, the most important thing is, is if you suspect you have Phragmites in your landscape or in your, your waterways or in your fields, get it identified. You know, contact us at the Lancaster County Weed uh, Office or any county weed superintendent across the state or your UNL extension agent, you know, uh, they'll be able to help you out too. But get it identified positively, know what you have out there, and then we can begin working on a management plan. Again, if you aren't sure about what's in your backyard or perhaps on your acreage, you can always talk to your local extension educator or contact the county weed office. Alrighty, let's take a few minutes to answer a few of your questions. Send us your emails and JPEG pictures to byf at unl.edu. Our first question comes from a viewer who didn't tell us where she's sending this from. So in this case, it probably doesn't hurt to not know, but we sure do appreciate knowing at least which part of the state you're sending a question from. She has damage in her landscape beds, great big holes with great big piles of soil around it, and then sort of these tunnel-like looking things. And she really thought it was a mole but of course, if you've watched our regular show and heard Dennis talk about the difference between moles and voles and rats and mice and all those little rodent-like cre creatures, you probably are guessing this is not a mole. Correct, this is a vole and vole damage and what she's seeing is really the tunnels and the soil collapsing into those little surface tunnels that are running along the ground because of course it was dry before we got our recent snow. So that's definitely voles and voles of course can be really one of the banes of the landscape. Our second question comes to us from Elkhorn. This is a viewer who has uh, an autumn blaze maple or a, a, one of the, the hybrid maples and has a lot of issues associated with it. It's showing some cracking on the west and the southwest side. It's showing some sloughing of the bark. Um, it's not really very thrifty. He's saying that you know there's a little bit of chlorosis potentially in it and some crown dieback. It's not a very old tree. It was moved in in 2016. Not necessarily the best of locations, but his question is what can be done about it and what happened. 
classic frost cracking or sun scald or the combination if you want to think of it that way on the maple with that softer thin bark west southwest facing side that as we get into warmer days which we can only hope for in the middle of the winter the sap will rise then it expands then it freezes then it cracks and that can cause real damage to a tree so in this instance it hasn't really shown much growth I really don't have hold out much hope for this turning into a really excellent tree uh, down the road a little bit. Our third question comes from, to us from the Columbus area. This is an issue with driving on the turf in the winter months or walking on the turf. This seems to get, be one that we get every single season and it's usually after the fact. And of course our turf specialists and our educators would say, Stay off that frozen turf because the damage that you think you see, which is either footprints or in this case it's lots of tire treads and tire tracks, that can easily manifest itself later in the season when the turf begins to green up as dead crowns. It's compacted, uh, that frozen, that, those frozen tissues in the turf, just like most of our other landscape plants, are really going to be damaged if, if you touch them. Uh, during the winter months. So stay off if you possibly can and certainly if you have to walk from one spot to another try to walk in different directions or, or a slightly different path so you're not really making that same path in the turf. Our fourth question is from an Omaha viewer. Uh, this is an interior houseplant question. People love the hibiscus, the big hardy ones that we grow that have uh, beautiful flowers the size of dinner plates. But people also like the tropical hibiscus, which are available oftentimes in the spring, either on standard or they are in containers and then they're used as a patio plant. This particular viewer has had really good luck with her uh, tropical hibiscus every single year, but she's noticed a lot of leaf spotting and yellowing and dropping and was really concerned that this is a disease as opposed to something that is environmental. Well, in this particular case, our good, our good pathologist Kyle says, yes, this is a leaf spot of some sort, and yes, it's probably environmental, and really sanitation is the absolute best thing to do. If you think about the drier air in a home, maybe it was in a location where it got a little bit of um, blowing off from the furnace, those kinds of things. Clean up those dead leaves or those leaves with the spots on them. Make sure you keep that plant well watered, but not too well watered. Just watch for any other signs of anything else happening in the plant. Perhaps it needs some fertilizer without seeing the, you know, the pot, the big uh, container in which that hibiscus is living. It might be something that is in, in quest for uh, some, some additional nutrition. To wrap up today's program, we're going to give you a little garden tour of the backyard farmer garden from last fall. All of the vegetables and annuals had been dug up, we put them in the compost bin. We shot this feature in late October to show you that even when everything else had faded, there are still some very colorful ornamentals that you could enjoy. Late fall, late October or into November is really a great time to look at your garden to see what actually still looks good. We've gone through some freezes, we've gone through some frost, some temperature swings, a lot of rain, now into some heat and some dreadful winds. And if you observe your garden and your plantings now, you can get an idea of maybe what you wanna do next year that can still look good well into the season. We'll start by talking about a few of our annuals that did make it through that light frost. And it's everything from the plectranthus in the containers, to Joseph's Coats, to a begonia. This is a perennial, so this doesn't count, but this is one of the golden hops vines that'll crawl up, crawl up the posts here. And a lot of these are in containers. You'll have to look specifically at varieties of annuals that still look good. Some of our All-America selections that have been great during the season are still spectacular, like our peppers. Two of them in particular are just gorgeous with those little peppers sticking up that you can eat if you want to. Some of them are pretty hot. We also have the kale or the ornamental cabbages and our cabbages this year have stretched. They've turned into this beautiful purpley top. They're very lacy. They survived most of the onslaught of the in insects over the summer and they really will contribute until we get a very, very hard freeze. 
We've torn out a lot of things that didn't look good and a part of re the reason for that in the fall is to go ahead and do the soil preparation. So again, look at your annuals and your container plants in particular, decide what you want to use next spring. We're going to talk next about some of the perennials that are beautiful well into the fall. Perennials that have evergreen, ever gray, ever purple, or ever chartreuse foliage, which means they last well into the winter months, are a great addition to the mixed landscape bed or to a perennial bed. You can look at some of the heucheras or the coral bells as an example. One of the lower sedums that's spectacular is the one called Angelina, goes into those chartreuse and then goes orange. And a real great surprise that we hardly ever see and we really don't talk about is a fall blooming crocus. We talk about all those bulbs that you plant now that'll flower in the spring. This one comes out as this beautiful, perfect breath of spring, pretty hardy, easy to manage if you don't forget where it was, and look at what that contributes to the late fall landscape. Finally, one of the things you want to decide is what you want to let stand over the winter months, or at least well into winter. The sedums are a great choice. These seed heads will dry and really contribute to the winter landscape. Of course, our good grasses can stand. You can see that we have a lot of things in the top of our rain chain that really have sort of gone downhill. Bugs have eaten them, the foliage has fallen off, they've gotten diseases. Better off to get those out of the way. You also need to take a look at where you're going to have issues with marauding critters in the winter months, because if you leave too many things standing, they're going to go in and dig around voles and all those good little critter guys. The other thing that you have to consider is whether you want perennials to seed themselves. And if seed heads are going to be an issue, cut them off. Gardening is truly a year-round activity. And color like this late in the fall is only possible if you have a good plan in the off-season of what to plant and where it will go. If you do it right, you'll have color in the garden from March to November. Thank you so much for joining us again for Lifestyle Gardening. Next time we'll be diving into the subject of fruit trees. We'll hear from extension experts about a fruit tree spray schedule for diseases and insects, and we'll interview Kimmel Orchard Operations Manager Vaughn Hammond. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So good day, good gardening. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening.